wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also, the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast or bird or reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. James has got a lot to say in chapter 3, but, but he begins in, in chapter 1. He says, he says some strong things. He says in chapter 1, verse 26, Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Let those words sink in. Every, everything that we do as, as Christian people come in this morning, our singing and our praying, our, our worship time, our conversations afterwards, all of it is worthless, the Bible says, if we don't control our tongues. This is serious stuff. We're going to spend the majority of our time in chapter 3. We're going to work our way through it verse by verse. And it all begins with a, a wake-up call. In verse 1, my old woodwork teacher, if he ever thought that the whole class wasn't paying attention, he, he would tap his fingertips, just his fingertips, on the roll-down blackboard, because that's how old I am. Uh, and I don't know how he managed to generate the power in just his fingertips, and it hurts mine <laughs> just doing that, because I'm a soppy office boy. But he, he would get everybody paying attention with the noise that he made from wrapping his fingertips on the blackboard. And, and James is doing the same thing in verse 1. This is a wake-up call because the first thing to see is this is for, for everyone. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Then verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. James is saying this isn't just for preachers or seminary students. It's about the church. And James makes it clear that the public teaching of God's word isn't, isn't for everyone. In fact, the verse is a warning. And unless you find in yourself an irresistible call to ministry, and unless you, your heart is burdened and opportunities to preach open up, and there's the recognition of your gifts within the church, and finally there's a call from the church to ministry, you've got to trust that God has got other things for you. Because preaching is for the intellectual? No. Because you've got to go to Bible college? I hope not. If you stay away from preaching, because and I say this with trembling, there is stricter judgment for those who do. Last year we, we commemorated 10 years that I've been the pastor here. Do you know 10 years ago, I put myself at greater jeopardy as a, as a believer? Because... From that moment on, I no longer have to answer only for my own faith, but how I handle God's word and how I've shepherded his people and, and how I've ministered the gospel. And, and there's no greater, sweeter, more heartbreaking work in the world than being a preacher of the gospel. And you young guys should, should test your gifts uh, and take hold of the opportunities made available to you, but never run carelessly into ministry. Unless you're certain of God's calling. But James is saying, verse 2, he's not talking just about preachers, but all of us, for we all stumble in many ways. Preacher or not, we all struggle. Whether you speak for business or for pleasure, we all sin with our words. 
Now, James gets into it with three terrible tongue truths. Number one, the tongue reveals our hearts. The tongue is a window into your heart. The first picture that James gives us is is of a man who opens his mouth and puts his foot in it. Verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man able to bridle his whole body. We all fail in many areas of our Christian walk. James says the Christian who's able to control their tongue, who never fails with their words, is perfect. Today we're very prone to blame circumstances and environment for the bad things that people do. Jesus says that's backwards. It's not about outside, but the inside that's the problem. Mark 7, 20 to 23. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And so just as the the weather gets a bit colder and you... You drive through Wyndham and you see smoke coming from a chimney. You immediately think there's a fire inside. So the words coming out of our mouths prove what's in our hearts. And if you're a person who never says anything wrong, you are perfect. How many perfect people here this morning? Not even those of you who've been Christians for 50 plus years. Second thing, the tongue is the key to self-control. Verse 3 and 4. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at ships also, though they're so large and driven by strong winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. It's two illustrations there that are just as helpful today as when they're written 2,000 years ago. You know, the animal that's responsible for the most human deaths in Australia isn't the great white or the black widow or the box jellyfish. It's the horse. Horses cause more human deaths than any other animals there. I was, I was queuing once for a football match in Liverpool. And we were walking along. I was in a crowd, a pretty rough crowd. And, and I turned around and I was looking up into the nostrils of a mounted policeman's horse. And this thing was massive. And, it, and it, was a, it was a reality check. Because us boys, especially when we're a bit younger, we think if we were ever involved in a medieval battle and somebody came at us on a horse, we'd just be able to grab him and pull him off and beat him up. No chance. You look at one of these horses, and, and it's just muscle. And then on top of it, another however many feet, is this armored policeman. It's a, it's a powerful thing. It's a dangerous thing if it's not treated properly. And yet many of you have ridden one without any trouble. Hamish can control one like a pro with just a little bit of metal and a leather strap. When we were on honeymoon, Sarah and I cruised around the Mediterranean. There were four times the population of Wyndham on the ship. Two swimming pools, four restaurants, a library, an arcade, a dance hall, a medical center, receptions, kitchens, cabins, equipment. The whole thing's directed by a little steering wheel. Control the reins, control the horse. Control the wheel, control the floating city. Control the tongue, you control the whole person. Number three, the tongue is small, but it is incredibly powerful. Verse five. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. In your phone is a tiny microchip that in one second can perform, what was it, 17 trillion calculations. One second, 17 trillion calculations. Verse 5, the tongue is very small, but it's very powerful. And just think about it, with your little tongue, you can do incredible things this morning. You can encourage a brother or sister. You can help a faltering Christian. You can 
build up somebody who's, who's feeling crushed and weighed down because of the things that they've had going on this week. Think of what human tongues have done on the, the world scale. Tongues have reshaped nations. They've transformed cultures. They've brought people back from the brink of suicide. You regularly use your, your tongues to, to comfort and encourage and build up. And, and that little tongue, even this morning, has, has been used to bring worship that delights the heart of God. And maybe in, on, on occasions we've even had opportunity to use our tongues to, to share the good news about Jesus with somebody and lead them to him. Our tongue is tiny, but so potent. But the same microchip in another person's phone, the same microchip in the police computer works just as effectively in the criminal's computer. And your little tongue that can do so much good can do so much harm too. It can tear down, it can upset. Words have, have ruined relationships, families, marriages. A slanderous lie can, can destroy a career or a reputation. You think of the, the damage done by, by the greats, by the Hitlers and the, the Stalins and the Mussolinis. Many people have used their tongues to speak against Jesus and to belittle Jesus and to, to draw others to themselves who will use their tongues to turn people away and, and drag them from places and, and people who can help them. Three things. The tongue reveals our hearts. It's the key to self-control. And it has great power. In short, James is telling us this needs to be controlled. This is a potent thing that must be controlled. And to drive it home, he shows us what happens when the tongue is allowed to run free when it's not controlled. Look at the end of verse 5 and verse 6. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. A world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. How many flames do you need to burn down a forest? Yeah, you got it right. Absolutely. Just the one. Only one. How big a spark does it take to blow up the whole petrol station? Just one little one. Hear stories, don't you, of people falling asleep with a cigarette in their mouth and burning down the whole house. Just a little hot ash can, can cause that much devastation. That's the destructive power of your tongue. And we say, James, surely this is over the top when he says the tongue is a world of unrighteousness. Well, you ask this question, how many people have you hurt with your hands? How many people have you hurt with your tongue? Or can you name one sin, just one, one sin that can't be expressed with your tongue? Pride, greed, gossip, blasphemy, bitterness, dishonoring your parents, envy in the way that you talk about the stuff that you just can't be without. Self-righteousness in how expert I am at justifying myself and even the things I do wrong. Lust in the jokes that people tell and the things that they'll say to each other or listen to online. The tongue is a world of evil. It corrupts the whole body and we're stuck with it our whole lives from when we're toddlers lying to our parents to when we're frustrated by old age and we get angry and bitter and complain at everything around us. A whole life of damage all adding up. An entire course of life, James says, set on fire by this little thing in my mouth. James isn't being extreme. He's just being honest. And even when he says that, that the tongue has the destructive power of hell, he's telling the truth. Now look at verse 7 and 8. In Costa Rica in 2011, a man named Chito organized the, friend, the, the funeral sorry, of his best friend, Poncho. And when they met, Chito saved Poncho's life. He found him lying next to the river with a bullet hole in his head 
He'd been shot by a local farmer. He picked him up, cared for him, took him home, saved his life. After he recovered, Pocho and Cheeto took uh, synchronized swimming shows together, and people would come from all around and watch them. They became national celebrities. 500 people turned up to Pocho's funeral. And there's pictures online of Cheeto weeping over the body of his friend. It's a weird story. What makes it bizarre is that Pocho was a 15-foot saltwater crocodile. If you don't believe me, you can watch them on YouTube. Swimming around together, playing together is mind-boggling. Because you're just watching this and you're thinking, when is this monster <laughs> going to tear him in half? When you see a crocodile so cold, who would have ever thought you could tame one of those? And yet it's easier to tame a killer croc than it is your tongue. All kinds of animals have been tamed, says James. But nobody has tamed the tongue. It is a restless evil, says James. It cannot be tamed. The moment you think it's under control, that's when it strikes. You think it's broken, that's when it throws you. It's restless. Never stops writhing. Always looking to break out of your control. It's full of poison, he says. And it only takes one little strike. Bite for a second to inject deadly venom. And we know that that's true, don't we? Because sometimes that, that quick word, simple word, said in haste or in anger or jealousy, it sits in somebody else's mind and it, it festers away and it ruins them. See, the reason I wanted to come here to James 3 today is we've spent 10 weeks talking about how we need to love each other. Uh, and the reality is all of that and any good work that's been done can be instantly undone by the monster in our mouth. What do we do about this? I was talking to, to Niels yesterday. If you don't know, it was fascinating to talk to because he was a hunter in South Africa. He's got some incredible stories, but he was talking about problem animals. And, and once a, a problem animal has been reported, something needs to be done about it. And James has reported to you and me there is a problem animal in our mouth. And something's got to be done about it. And thankfully, the Bible doesn't just identify a problem, but it prescribes the cure. And James has got a three-step program for us in verse 9 to 12. Step one. The first thing that we have to do in dealing with these tongues is accept our failure. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Maybe... You're a person who doesn't worry too much about hurting other people with the things that you say. Maybe you don't think hurting others with your tongue is an issue. There's plenty of people in Southland who think like that, who convince themselves, I'm just a person who tells the truth. I'm just a straight talker, straight shooter. If people get upset, that's on them. And we can look at somebody like that and think, well, that's a strong character. And, and I've got to say, sometimes I wish I was more like that. But then I remember Jesus was not like that. And Paul wrote, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, in other words, if I speak the best I possibly can, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. And so if our speech is marked by love, it's not good, it's out of tune. It's not admirable, it's obnoxious. And what's worse it destroys our witness with hypocrisy. What do I mean? Well, there are many Christians, in fact, perhaps all Christians, we'd never dare say anything bad about God. But there are many Christians who are totally fine with gossiping about a person and running them down behind their back, speaking badly of them when they're not around. What are we thinking Says James, that person is made by God. From the same mouth come blessings and curses, my brothers. Verse 9, with it we bless the Lord our Father and we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. If they're a Christian, they're united to Christ. If they're a human, they're made in God's image. If they've been saved by Him, they've been bought by His blood and they're an ongoing work of His sanctifying grace. How could we claim to love the artist while spitting on his artwork? That's hypocrisy. 
And yet we do it every time we come to church and use our tongues to worship God and then use that very same tongue on the car journey home to belittle his people. God's people. His image bearers. His treasured possession. It is an empty claim to say we love the Lord Jesus if there's no one settling in our heart when we hurt his people. Our tongues make us hypocrites. They they, they empty our our witness of its its power. Everything that we've got to say about God that's that's good this morning, it, it becomes void if we're happy to go home and run his people down. That's Dr. James' diagnosis. Now here's the question. Do you have the humility to accept it? Because if you ignore the diagnosis, it doesn't stop the illness. It just gives it opportunity to thrive. But if we're ready to accept, yes, I've been a hypocrite. And my tongue can be heavenly one moment and hellish the next. Then I'm in a place to receive the cure. You know, there's a reason why Jesus is rejected by the religious leaders and not by the prostitutes and the tax collectors. He said it straight in love. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It's not those who don't think they've got a problem who are going to come seeking help, but those who know they're sick. And so he says, I've not come to call righteous people to repentance, but sinners. The person who's blind to their problem will never seek a cure, never see their need of Jesus. The first step then to conquering your tongue is recognizing this is an issue for me. Step two. Don't despair. Look at verse 10. From the same mouth come blessing, cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. The the hypocrisy of an untamed tongue is a serious thing. But it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Notice James still calls us brothers. He's saying this is a problem that Christians face. And so if you, if you can't get a grip on your tongue, don't let it drive you to despair. It doesn't mean you're not saved. It doesn't even mean that you're an, a weak or abnormal Christian. Despite our best efforts, every Christian here struggles with our tongue. But that doesn't mean we should accept it. James says these things ought not to be so. We've got to be making a real effort to address this issue. Now, now let me also say the other side of that coin then, that, that hypocrisy of Christians is not a good enough excuse for not becoming a Christian. I've had friends who say, you know, I like Christianity. I like what Jesus has to say. But all Christians are hypocrites. Yeah. Yeah, we are. You, you're right. God's word tells us that you're in agreement with the scriptures. But we don't say to you, come to church and be like us. We say, come to Jesus and be like him. He's the one you need. You you come and meet the one man who always controlled his tongue. The one whose every word was marked by love. And who never once spoke in haste or hate. You come to Jesus and live. You put us to the test, you'll find all sorts of faults and failings. You put Jesus to the test and finding him, find in him perfection, satisfaction, salvation. The third step then is to deal with the source. And, and there are so many practical points and different angles that we could take on addressing this. You know, we could find ourselves accountability partners to, to confess to when we're having a problem with what we're saying. There's all sorts of things that we could do practically. But the, the most important answer to this is that we get to the core issue. Verse 11 and 12. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. You can't have both salt and sweet, bitter and sweet water from the same source. 
And, and it's impossible to have two types of fruit from the same tree. It's got to be one or the other. Now, if you taste water from the, the river, which I know isn't recommended locally, but it's not terrible, especially if you're from the UK and you've seen the rivers that we've got over there. <laughs> but if you tasted the water from the river and there was something in it that you knew immediately was wrong, where would you go to fix it? You don't go downstream, right? Because you know if it's, if it's wrong here and it's flowing that way, <laughs> It's going to continue to be bad that way. You go upstream and you keep going until you find the source of the problem. To tame our tongues, we've got to go to the source. Now, what's the source of your words? What moves your tongue? Luke 6, 45. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your tongue is a puppet, and the strings are pulled by your heart. There's a hotel in America, and, and a number of the guests were complaining that the water tasted and smelled funny. And, and after a, enough people had made a fuss, they eventually investigated and found a dead body in one of the water tanks on the roof. Behind our bitter tongue. There is a rotten corpse. There's an old self that, that every day we try and put to death. But that still creates a stench in our life. And every moment of every day, the Christian is faced with the choice. In this situ situation, am I going to behave like the Lord Jesus? Will I speak like Jesus did? Will I obey his commands? Will I love him and obey his word? Or am I going to speak and act like my old self? And do what I think is best. When we obey Christ. Our mouths are like springs of sweet, life-giving, refreshing water. But when we act according to the sinful self, our mouths are no better than a sewage pipe. Now the only way to change that is to go to the source. How do I deal with my heart? You go to the Lord Jesus, the one who gives new hearts. And I don't mean that in some airy, floaty, super spiritual way. I mean, if you are serious about getting a grip on your tongue, if you're determined to make a change, you've got to go this afternoon prayerfully to your Bible and ask the Holy Spirit to increase your love for the Lord Jesus. And then you've got to read. And you've got to read and read. And see in God's word how Jesus loves you. How he never said anything wrong or hurtful. How he never did any harm to anybody with his tongue. Only good. And yet he still, out of love for you, went to the cross. And was willingly treated by his father. Like the blasphemer, the hypocrite, and the slanderers that we have been. You see that love. Love that gives a perfect life. That lays it down. That goes to a horrific death. See that love for you and you let it work on you. You stew in it. Sit in it. Until all you care about is honoring the one who stepped down from glory and gave himself for you. And you read, and, and you read until you consider everything else worthless in comparison to the treasure of relationship with Jesus. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. And from the overflow of that Christ-raptured heart. Then the mouth speaks. And your tongue that's got so much potential to do evil. Your tongue like a, a nuclear launch button tucked behind your teeth. Will be so much less of a threat to the love and mission of our church. And so much more a tool for cultivating, beautifying, defending and, and propagating love amongst God's people. Let's pray.